Thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, this is truly a great honor for me to be giving this uh, Tyler Laureate lecture. There are many, many, many I have to thank, but I'm saving all that for uh, tomorrow, the awards dinner. And um, normally what I do <coughs> is that, let's say two months from now, you're going to forget everything I said, or I'll, I'll be saying today. But if I want to keep one message, and that's there, so hopefully you'll remember that. The point I want to make is that we have already put enough of these so-called greenhouse gases, pollutants, that are surrounding the planet, and they're in the process of warming the planet. And we have already committed the planet to enough warming to make many threshold level of what I call iconic changes. My uh, distinguished colleague, Professor Ali, would talk about some of those, and I'll describe what others are. What I'm going to do is that this is, as you know, a rather pessimistic uh, conclusion. So I want to walk you through the science which led to that. And also, uh, I, I have been, I must say, extremely discouraged about my science. Every time I stick an instrument in the air, I come back with one more disaster. So I've been starting to work on solutions. And so I'm go I've hopefully I've left time to touch on that. And, and, and the bottom line is, there is a way to get out of this mess. And uh, not that I have the way, I have a way, but there are many ways. So just to get a perspective on the problem, <laughs> let's look at that image on the uh, left-hand side. That was really taken, you know, I was following on a Gulf aircraft, dust plume and pollution plume from China all the way across the Pacific into the US. Um, believe me, I did track down many soot particles and black carbon all the way across over San Diego and on to Colorado. But in any case, you know, we had to dodge on that day two cyclones and we, we did manage to do that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> The thing I want to make is that, you know, when we go outside, we look at the atmosphere, it looks vast. You say, oh, we can't do much about it. I mean, this is just really huge. It turns out, you know, look at the perspective. It's really a thin, vulnerable layer, extremely thin layer. And it's in this layer we are dumping billions and billions of tons of pollutants. And what is the source of that? Of course, smokestacks, automobiles, biomass burning, agriculture, and that's my grandmother's kitchen. And I have enjoyed some of the best meals uh, in that kitchen. So the question I want to ask is, why should she worry about what car I'm driving here? Likewise, why should she, we worry about what she's cooking with? Take a close look at the movie next. My grandmother is not uh, uh, no more. But let's just imagine she's there. This movie shows how fast air particles travel across the world. It just takes air three to five days to go all the way from China across into the US and comes in billions and billions and tons of other things, pollutants they emit. So when the Chinese are giving us their gift, we are passing along our gift to Europeans. L lot less time, just in two days, two to three days and pollution from Europe goes on to Asia. <clears throat> there are many lessons in this. Every time I look at it, I see something new. See remarkably how in short time, biomass burning in South America dives into the Antarctic, into the polar oceans. So the more uh, uh, other message I want to convey is that we are not going to solve this problem by pointing fingers at each other. This is a problem we have collectively created and we've got to solve it collectively. And so that's the issue I want to touch on. So we have surrounded the planet with these gases. So why should we worry about this blanket? Imagine on a cold winter night, you put a blanket on you. It keeps you warm. Not because the blanket gives any heat. It just traps the body heat, right? And so prevents the heat from your body escaping. So you're warmer. They're trying to get rid of more heat. That's exactly how the greenhouse gases work. They trap the heat, which would have left the planet. We call it infrared radiation. And so the planet has to get hotter to get rid of the heat, because the planet always tries to maintain what we call an energy balance, balance between what's coming in and going out. So that, in a nutshell, 
is this whole thing about why we are worried about greenhouse gases. It's well-known physics, quantum mechanically, we have measured all the <coughs> absorption characteristics, etc. So the most deadly of these greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. Why is that anything we burn, any combustion, ultimate byproduct is carbon dioxide. The fuel is carbon and hydrogen molecules stuck together. So the carbon becomes CO2. Okay? We used to think until the 1970s, carbon dioxide is the only greenhouse gas we have to worry about. Then I was new to that field. I was a postdoc in an obscure institution looking at reentry physics. And I chanced on this famous paper by Roland and Molina where they talked about chlorofluorocarbons releases the chlorine and will attack, attack ozone layer. And then in graduate school I had learned any polyatomic molecule has tremendous vibrational degrees of freedom and it absorbs and emits radiation. So I started to look at the greenhouse effect. I was shocked to find adding just one molecule of CFC has the same heating effect as 10,000 molecules of carbon dioxide. And thank goodness for the work by Molina and Rowland, and then the Antarctic ozone hole, CFCs were banned. Had we not had that discovery, we would be talking about a CFC catastrophe in terms of climate change. I did not realize that till Ralph Cicerone two years ago pointed that out. So after the CFC work, whole host of new gases were discovered, were warming the planet. There was methane, there was nitrous oxide coming from fertilizers, and ozone is another issue I, I was working on. What we think of ozone here as a pollutant is also a major greenhouse gas. So all that put together, uh, WMO had asked me to chair a panel, and we basically concluded, first of all, the chemistry and climate became strongly linked because of the tropospheric ozone. Okay? So we can't think of the climate system independent of the chemistry. The whole cottage industry of us, you know, work is going on there. But we basically concluded that the non-carbon dioxide trace gases contribute as much as CO2. And then about 10, 15 years later, the so-called intergovernmental panel of climate change, I belong to that, and they got their, uh, I mean, uh, they were awarded the Peace Prize in 2007. Their report and the earlier reports concludes, you know, confirmed our findings that CO2, I'll start to tell you what this unit is, but think of that as thickening of the blanket, okay? Carbon dioxide is thickening the blanket so much, then these other gases and ozone, when you add it all up, it's pretty close to CO2. But on the one hand, this is bad news. We thought we had to just deal with CO2, now we have to deal with all these other things. But it's also good news because some of these gases are easier to get rid of than CO2. And somehow that message has gotten lost in the current discussion of how to deal with the problem. And I want to touch on that. So uh, realizing that we are creating more problem, I teamed up with a well-known meteorologist, Roland Madden. We started to see when are we going to see this warming. Okay? There's the other thing I want to point out, although many of you are reading about the problem in the last five, 10 years, Scientists working in this field, just not only me, but almost all scientists working in the field realize it's going to be a major problem. Look at how we start the paper. We are saying the possible climate effects of large increase in CO2 may constitute one of the important environmental problems of the coming decades. So this was sort of, we knew this. We meaning I'm talking about collectively. And, and in that paper, it was a detailed quantitative analysis of temperature records and models, we said, we should see this warming by year 2000. So this was a prediction, and this whole detection and attribution has become a major field now. I'm pleased to see there's so much work going on. <coughs> Unfortunately, that prediction was also confirmed in this IPC 2001. So look at the temperature records, okay? It has hiccups, goes up, goes down, goes up, and then has been going up. Our paper was published in 1980 when it was going down. <laughs> So when my paper came out, I remember so many meteorologists said, you're crazy. We're going through a cooling trend, not a warming trend. And you can see by year 2000, this was what we were quantifying, the so-called variability. And we said it'll rise above this so-called noise by year 2000. 
So given that, I'm, I'm in 2008, came up myself and my colleague Fang, came up with another prediction that forget about the future increase, using what IPCC said is how much we have thickened the blanket, and IPCC's estimate of climate sensitivity, that is the warming we compute, what the planet has already put in the bank. It's already in the bank. Okay? The interesting thing is, the last four or five years we are realizing there is no such thing as going to be a one warming. It's a probabilistic thing. So the warming, the median, or the, that it's going to warm by two and a half degrees, but there's a 10% probability we have overestimated it. Okay? But there is a 10% probability the warming could be as high as four degrees. So the question I ask the policymakers, what are you doing to hedge against this possibility? Okay? Most of us are thinking about these two degrees. In any case, on overlaid on that, I put the so-called iconic changes. It's coming from a paper by Schellenhuber. He was a science advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel. So we know, scientists say, anywhere between one and a half to two and a half degrees, the Arctic summer ice may disappear. And the one I'm focusing on, to me it's the most ominous, is the potential disappearance of the Himalayan Hindu Kush Tibetan glaciers. Why is that? I'll talk to you about that. Now the question you can ask is, well, you're saying we already committed the planet. All we have seen so far is only six tenths of a degree. What happened to the rest? Either the model is wrong or something is going on. And it is this something I started looking for since 1995. I'm going to bring in now air pollution. Particulates, aerosols it's called. I'm going to call it atmospheric brown clouds. So one thing I want to tell you about my research is I have to touch and feel it before I trust anything I do, or at least I should be able to see it. So the aerosol brown cloud, I don't have to tell Los Angelinos about that. You can see the brown cloud. Unfortunately, this was taken just three, four years ago. Okay. So is it an urban problem? That's what we thought. And until we did this experiment in 19... 96 to 1999. It was originally proposed, proposed by Professor Paul Crutzen and myself. Later, over 200 scientists joined. India played a major role, and there are many European nations. I want to show you quickly what we discovered. See, our whole idea is, you know, the northern Indian Ocean is subject to pollution from South Asia, and then, you know, Middle East, and Saudi Arabia, etc. So we thought we just take a ship and go north and south and take planes north and south. I'm comparing smoking versus non-smoking to use a metaphor. Okay. So we compared air mass. Look at what we found. First of all, the entire Arabian Sea was filled with these brown clouds. So we know it's not an urban problem. Okay, it's a large-scale regional problem. And then see what we found. Mother Nature produces these beautifully looking particulates, we call them sea salt or sulfur, sulfates. What we found, and this is typically what you would find if you do the same analysis here, this is basically transmission electron microscopy. You know, you take filters, then go to the lab and analyze it. So you can see every particle was attached with this ugly looking soot. Okay? We had to go 3,000 kilometers away from the source to see they, you know, natural particles. And we already saw from the movie, there's no place in the planet we have not impacted, okay? So what did we found, I think what was discovered in that, in the you know, report in these two papers, but other papers, that these particles were called, what's now called global dimming, okay? We know that. When the sky is polluted, it's hazy. Why is it hazy? It's bouncing some sunlight back. That was known. What we discovered was the dimming was also caused by this black carbon absorbing particles. So you can intercept sunlight two ways, one bouncing it back, mirrors. Okay? So let's go back to this blanket. I want you to keep this blanket on. Don't go to sleep, just keep the blanket on. We have put mirrors on the blanket. The blanket is trying to warm you, but then we have put the mirrors, it's bouncing the heat, it tends to cool. But in addition to that, we have filled this blanket with dust, soot. It's trapping sunlight. So making this blanket an electric blanket. So it's got two sources of heating. One, greenhouse gases, another sunlight. 
Okay? And this was, you know, we really caught this in its act. We will take the ship, go in and out of the plume. That's the clean air, the sunlight, and the polluted air, almost 30% cut down. The magnitude shocked us. And to this day, I've been asking marine biologists, what does it mean to impact on life on the oceans? You know, everything depends on sunlight. But I'm focusing on the climate. So we took this data, put it all together with various ground observations, aircraft, and satellite observations. Remember, I said I don't believe anything until I can touch, see, or feel it. So when we assembled the data and put it together, that is the dimming, decrease of sunlight in the ocean. Okay, But some of that is because these particulates, the dust in your blanket is trapping, that's the heating. If you look at what the greenhouse gas is doing, its trapping is somewhat uniform. These particulates is, you know, patchy because their lifetime is still small enough. It's concentrated close to the source. I'm going to talk, first talk to you about this dimming. Look at how bond, or most of the northern hemisphere ocean, we have cut the sunlight. Okay, And I want to focus on, again, I'll, I'll come back to that, the heating by the soot will be, is now thought of responsible for the Arctic sea ice. See how much heating is going on. See how much are the glaciers. Okay? I don't have proof for this yet, and I'll show you later. But this I have. I showed you direct observations. So you know, this, oh, sorry. I'm well known to miss my punchline. I missed the punchline in this. <laughs> Remember, I went looking for this missing heating, right? The prediction is the planet should have warmed by 2 and a half degrees. We have only seen a quarter of that. So where, what happened to the missing? So when I add these two, that's what we get, the minus. So the brown, brown clouds, or aerosols, have masked the greenhouse forcing by almost 50%. IPCC value is more like 42 to 43%, and their values are largely derived from models. So it is sort of reassuring. Coming independently, we are not that far off. So that's the reason we have not seen the warming. And, and, and they've got a bad and a good news. Um, one of the things is that regional sponge, if you look at the, what happened to the rainfall in the planet, this is the well-known Sahelian drought. Okay, as you know, sub-Saharan Africa was decimated by this drought in the 70s. But I'm more focusing on this decrease in the monsoon rainfall. And here also North Shelf shift. And the reason to think about the dimming on the rainfall is the water that falls on us. It was evaporated in the ocean, right? What's the source for that? Sunlight. Sunlight goes to the ocean, evaporates the moisture, and then the winds take it and they fall on our head. So the dumbest thing we can do is cut the sunlight. So when you cut the sunlight, you've got to reduce the evaporation. And this was known, I mean, many models have shown this, but what we showed here is that this particular thing was caused by the dimming by the brown clouds because the greenhouse warming by itself should you know, make the rainfall more intense in the tropics. And there's another group, NASA group, showed this, they need the brown clouds. And there's an Australian group who suggested the Sahelian drought was caused by the dimming of the North Atlantic. But these are all ongoing research. And again, uh, there was many resistance when we said there is a decrease in rainfall. And IPCC again confirmed our findings, said that, in fact, the Gangetic Plains is getting drier. So I've teamed up with some uh, agriculture economists and said, what is the impact on rice harvest? Okay, they, Offhammer is at Berkeley, and Jeff Vincent is at Duke. And, and we, what you see in India, there's a wet season harvest. Because of the green revolution, the rice production increased dramatically. That's what sustained the huge population increase. And India is you know, self-sufficient. But that's what's worrying the Indian government. The sick is that it's leveled off. They are putting fertilizer, they are trying to do everything. It's leveled off. And our paper suggests it's because of the decrease in rainfall. You have less rain. And because one, much of them depend on the, not irrigation, rainfall. So going on to remember, I, I said there is this heating I have to explain. And that required a peculiar platform that's not available. So we worked for five years to develop this unmanned aircraft. And I had a team of scientists and engineers miniaturized instruments. Okay? 
there are over 26 instruments squeezed into a half shoe box size in these aircraft. And they'll be launched and we put a guided so that we can precisely know where it's going. And so all of that would be done in the ground by my students, yes, flying aircraft. And what we found was again disturbing. We had one aircraft flying above the cloud to see how much sunlight was coming in, and one to see how much was coming through. So we were able to deduce the heating. It was as large as what they showed in the other map. But the thing with there was that was not the disturbing finding. My aircraft was here. And fortunately, on the same year we flew, NASA flew a fantastic mission with a laser instrument. And that showed, that's Himalayas surrounded by these brown clouds, both sides, from the Chinese side and the Indian side, from pollution, okay? And you're pumping heating there, and the hot air goes up the mountains, and that's what we found in a model. 50% of the reason these glaciers are retreating is from the heating. And we have a station, the highest station in the world, it's, it's part of our program, but maintained by Italians, on the base cap of Mount Everest. You know how much black carbon I'm finding? We are, we are finding almost about 500 to 1,000 nanograms. It's in the, supposed to be the most pristine part of the planet. If I stick the same instrument here in Los Angeles, I would find somewhere between you know 1,000 to 2,000. It's almost like we are living in an urban area right in the Mount Everest. So uh, going to that, the reason the Himalayan glaciers is a big issue is that they provide the headwaters for all the major rivers, the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra, the Mekong, and the Yangtze and Elo River. It's in fact the water fountain of Asia. Over two and a half billion depend on that. <coughs> and when we started talking to some of the policymakers and scientists, the comment was, our rivers are flowing abundantly. Of course, when the glaciers are melting, the river flow will increase. But when it has gone half gone, that's when you see the drawing, OK? Uh, but now I'm happy to say the Indian government has recognized this as the major issue for them in terms of climate change. Just next month, all of the chief ministers of all the mountain states are meeting to talk about it. I was pleased to say, they said, we need to understand the effect of black carbon and carbon dioxide. So they recognize there is an issue here. So this is sort of the summary. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I'm sure some of this would be discussed uh, with Professor Richard Alley. Uh, so we, you know, that's the Gangotri feeding the Ganges. And it's, it has been retreating quite alarmingly. And we are working with some of the Indian groups to see if we can send our UAVs to measure the black carbon. I first have to convince them that I'm not spying on India or Pakistan using this UAV. Okay? We are also sending up, just now getting UAVs to the Arctic to find <coughs> out. Because both here and here, now scientists are saying about half the reason they're all retreating is because of black carbon. When the soot deposits in snow, it makes the snow dirty. And then the snow starts absorbing more sunlight. In fact, that's the technique they use to clear snow for the army. Okay? And, and so now I'm going to go to, going to solutions. Okay. Obviously, we have to go after the villain. The villain is carbon dioxide emissions. And look at how, in spite of everything we are talking about, CO2 emissions is taking off astronomically. Okay? The growth rate is about a factor of four larger, starting from 2000 compared to here. And of course, that's my colleague, Dave, famous Dave Keeling, pre previous laureate, you know, his car, CO2 is increasing. And now let's talk about the new administration, President Obama, as well as the Copenhagen discussions, they are talking about cutting down the CO2 emission by 50%. If you do that, that will be a miraculous achievement. But my estimates show that's not going to do much. Right now, we are putting about 8.5 billion tons of carbon as carbon dioxide. If we don't do anything, we would have put 110 gigatons. If we cut the emission by 50%, we would still be putting 80 billion tons. That's a lot of billion tons to put into the air, OK? So the meaning the warming is going, keep, is going to increase, but not as fast. Still, it's going to increase. I'm saying we already pushed the planet to 2 and a half. We are just going to the right of my curve, not to the left. So I want to go to the left of my curve, OK? So 
to summarize it, that's how much we have thickened the blanket, about 2.4. Because of this ABC's masking effect, this is what the planet is feeling. So if I cut down the black carbon selectively, the committed warming goes from 1.3 to 0.6. And if I come reduce ozone, I go to 0.3. If you are here, I would not have gotten this award. The problem would have been a trivial problem. Right? So there is a way, but at the same time, I don't want to mislead you. That's a short-term fix, meaning we need some time. Ultimately, we've got to reduce CO2. Otherwise, the warming is going to go to 4, 6, 8 degrees. So it becomes science fiction. So I'm not saying do this in place of. We've got to keep our eye on the CO2 ball. But we know it's not going to hedge against any disastrous warming in the next 20, 30, 40 years. So we need a plan, and that plan is let's go after black carbon on this. So I'm not reduced to, so like I said, I started working on the solutions. So we are starting such a project. In India, 63%, 65% of the black carbon emission is coming from my grandmother's cooking. So I'm going to pick on her again. So we did that study. Okay, This was published in Nature. If we just eliminate biofuel cooking, cooking with firewood, cow dung, and crop residues. It almost looks like as you've got a car with a dirty window, you just take a wet sponge and wipe it. It's gone. Okay? And the beauty of this is it'll be gone two weeks from now if we do it today. Okay? So the, we have an immediate quick fix to the problem. Hopefully that will give us about 10, 20 years time to have revolutionary technology to bring down CO2. And, and so I went back to that kitchen, but that, my, that house is now bought over by the family who used to maintain my, uh, the farm. And I wanted to go there to take some pictures, but she insisted I come back and eat her cooking. So she's just cooking a dish for me there. But it was unfortunately using firewood. I told her I'd better, better, better stop. Okay? So the project was launched uh, just last month. It was in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, and you can see the village chief you know, we met with the village, told them what we're planning to do, and we're distributing these cookers. The reason she's touching that, this is a revolutionary stove, that has been burning for about 40 minutes by then, and still it's cold outside. So its heat protection capacity is fantastic. Will it escape? I'm still a bit unhappy. The, the flame is a little bit brownish. You know, it has to be blue to cut down all black carbon. And then we're also giving them solar-powered lamps because that's the main problem in the villages. There's no electricity. They use kerosene. Kerosene is another source of black carbon. Okay? So the project has gotten started. But one of the things about this project is that it's not just not remo replacing with stoves. We want to do scientific demonstration of what impact it has on the environment so that we can go to the United Nations, to President Obama, and say, if you reduce cooking by one kilogram, you're going to save so much <coughs> retreat of the glacier ice. Okay? So most comprehensive measurements we could undertake, and the thing which is going to revolutionize our data collection is using cell phones. We are miniaturizing our instruments. I'll show you some of that. That's being led by, you can guess from the last name, she's my daughter, but she's at UCLA, uh, independent of and they, their lab, Deborah, Esther, and Nithya, is leading the effort. And here it's shown, you know, that's one of the miniature sensors in the house. Every day there is a filter. So this woman would take a picture of this filter with black carbon and send it out. Okay? So we want to instrument as soon as a thousand of these homes. And then they will also collect epidemiological data, the most carefully planned epidemiological data. It will all be beamed into that. Our dream and vision is that ultimately we'll be able to monitor the air pollution exposure. And I know we have the most distinguished person in this field, uh, Professor Jonathan Samet, who has done pioneering work on this. So ultimately, my, I'm happy to report to you, just yesterday, I got this message from Andy Rufkin, something I've been waiting last five years for, to see the government take response. I'm pleased to say, this black carbon issue has unified both Democrats and Republicans, particularly John Kerry and you know, 
you know, for Oklahoma, but as far apart on most environment as it's possible to be. They both agree and want to push a legislation on black carbon. So uh, the last thing I want to say is that, sort of departing from the science, you know, uh, I'm still personally discouraged at how slow things are moving. I mean, it's really sad. And uh, I attended in the last two years many high-level meetings, you know, prime ministers and this and that. And what I found, uh, particularly, there was a big meeting in Delhi when I was there. Uh, John Kerry was there, our senator, and then Indian prime ministers were there, and uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon from UN. <coughs> Everyone, they were focusing on what could be done, not on what should be done. And so my issue is, I think the only way we're going to solve the problem is each one of us start doing projects like Surya, use our science, use our connection, but we need a motivation. So you can ask me, what is my motivation? That's my granddaughter. And you know, to me, that picture is symptomatic. I'm pretty optimistic we're going to solve it. She's thinking, no, my grandpa is going to leave the problem to me to solve. <laughs> I hope we don't do that. Thank you.